Okay, very good morning. Thursday, 25th of March. Hope you're doing well. Good morning to the Amplifier Live community. And if you are watching this delayed on YouTube, as ever, it would be massively appreciated if you could hit the subscribe button. More content coming in the coming days, even over the weekend as well. So it'd be great to have you as part of our online community. But let's get straight stuck into what's going on this morning. And not going to spend too much time actually on the charts. I'll leave the guys on the live stream to go into that in more detail but just giving an overall flavor of market sentiment here at the European Open I'm filming this just going into 7 a.m. Uh, London time this morning and markets I'd say a little bit indecisive I guess of how to take this latest new COVID wave idea um, yesterday we did see the Nasdaq then underperform down around 1.68 percent by the time we closed on Wall Street comparative to the Dow which was flat, which was almost the opposite case of what we had in the prior day. So much more reflective then of initially uh, on Tuesday, it was kind of a, a move back into pandemic related plays. Oil got hit, airline stocks got battered. Whereas yesterday was a little bit of a reversal of that. Perhaps people just picking up um, some of those particular sectors on the cheap and just riding them back up and uh, and the, the Nasdaq was an underperformer, oil bounced. Uh, we'll have a little talk about the Suez, uh, some OPEC source comments as well uh, in context of the potentially threatened demand on the new lockdowns pertaining to the new COVID wave um, or helping support price there. But overall, the other interesting thing is, is dollar strength. And we pretty much have the Dixie trading at its highest levels of this year at the moment. Um, in terms of this morning, there hasn't been a great deal of fluctuation. It's pretty much flat up to around one tenth of, of 1%. Uh, as you can see then in the major pairs in the top left, Euro, Dollar and Cable still remain close to their relative lows. Uh, I'll just have a quick look at Cable here. You know, quite a nice breakdown in price that we've had through this week on initial tests break comes back to the level and then moves lower we've had now a few recovery up to the same level in the futures market 137 36 before the move lower uh, and just this trend line here short term just keeping an eye on this morning on the daily chart unaltered from what we were talking about yesterday really uh, on the daily that 3681 was where the market found support yesterday uh, and also so far today here at the open which was that coinciding with the low on the 8th of feb but Continuation in the dollar move, then downside would be looking for potentially deeper moves here in cable towards really the 136 handle uh, to keep an eye on. Um, let's get straight into some of the headlines there and talk about the news and, and what is going on. I'm going to start off with an update on the, the vaccine situation. Before I jump to Astra, let's just talk about this ongoing dispute between the EU and the UK over the distribution of ingredients and the exportation of, of vaccines. And Britain and the European Commission uh, last night issued a joint statement saying that there have been discussions on developing a reciprocal beneficial relationship to tackle COVID-19. However, they did caution not to overinterpret, and this was not a supply deal, rather the beginning of a negotiation. <coughs> The EU leaders, they are meeting um, later on today. In fact, I'll, I'll get the timings of the exact um, discussions that are happening later on today. Uh, but they are going to be discussing the situation during a video conference summit on Thursday. Uh, that summit over two days today and tomorrow for those European officials. So a little bit of a, of a, of a softening of what was looking like an increasingly tentious uh, issue um, so one to watch still and potentially more comments coming out this afternoon, but a bit of a step in a more positive direction in that regard. AstraZeneca was the other one, obviously following on from the US criticism from that latest trial, which um, pointed to somewhat dubious data points in regard to the efficacy rate of their drug. Uh, the company have come out and said that their vaccine is 76% effective in its US trial. Um, that came again after that independent monitoring board expressed concerns uh, and is against comparable its previous disclosure of 79% uh, efficacy but 79% to 76% I don't really think is reason for concern in terms of the actual effectiveness of the vaccine that's still a, a particularly high number in fact um, I, I understand that obviously comparative to some of the 90-95% readings we had seen it's 
it's not up in that region, but comparatively uh, as a vaccine, it's still you know, margin at the margin when we're talking about these few percentage points. What's a bigger um, impact here potentially is the fact that the actual key component in any successful deployment of a vaccine is the public's belief and confidence in the, in the uh, I guess, not just the effectiveness of it, but the reliability of it. Uh, and that's something that's been severely dented for Astra, just given a combination of different things, not only a, a series of kind of data blunders that they've had um, since this vaccine has been in development several months ago, but also as well, the types of remnant criticism has come up against from European politicians has seen uh, the, the likelihood of the, the general public wanting to take the Astra drug diminish rapidly comparative to others. So yeah, it's more of a, a, an issue for Astra generally and the confidence within the firm. We have seen earlier in the week, their stock price has been, has been underperforming uh, to some respect on the back of that kind of idea. Um, but overall, the actual drug, you know, standing out of the, the crosshairs for a moment, you know, I, I think overall this is a, a generally a positive story in terms of the overall COVID crisis that the globe is facing at the moment, because obviously Astra is a pivotal drug in the global solution to, to getting on control um, and inoculating the global population. The other thing I, I quickly wanted to mention was, was the Suez. Um, had a few questions about this yesterday. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about the details, I'm going to talk about the maritime routes, and I'm going to talk about a few tips about you know, why this type of episode is really good for your, for your learning on a fundamental basis. Um, Bloomberg, Reuters, the other media news agencies uh, are talking about the rally we had in Crude yesterday uh, being pinned on the Suez. I find that a bit of a stretch, to be quite frank. Um, if that were true, and at the moment the passage is still blocked, and therefore the number of uh, the, the the size of disruption is getting worse well then on that theory the price would still be going higher and it's not so for me i think brent on the not yesterday the prior uh, day prior to that uh, it was the biggest decline we'd seen in brent since october of last year so for me it was a bit of buying off the lows um, i still think that there's a healthy degree of appetite to buy at strategically technically key points and um, definitely, I think a Tuesday into Wednesday session offered that uh, 57.32. I mean, these are again unaltered charts from the markups from Monday's briefing. And having a discussion with one of the senior traders here uh, yesterday, you know, both of us remain still relatively um, secure in the fact that even if this price does come down, it will be supported because even if there's a COVID wave that dis dis disrupts demand short term, more medium, longer term, overall economic activity will boom in the period ahead. Um, it's just a matter of timing. And then your insurance policy on the back of that is the fact that OPEC plus will do whatever is necessary in order to ensure then that the price is supported. And in fact, we actually had sources yesterday saying exactly that. They said that they were likely to keep output mostly steady at the April meeting due to the lockdowns. So lockdowns that we're seeing like some mainland Europe and, and elsewhere as COVID cases start to rise again. <coughs> also as well, increasing oil exports in Iran and that's watering down somewhat the actual um, kind of strength, if you like, of the supply pack. So all the more reason to roll it over. And as you can see here, technically a nice bounce off those lows that we were seeing. Uh, initial resistance support back in early early February. So could we get lower? Could we get below this point? Yeah, perhaps. But even if we come down to say 53, 51, I do think you'll get strong buying uh, from people in more medium term positions that will step in uh, and lift the price if we are able to get there. We're already kind of seeing that at the moment, some of the price activity. So the Suez thing, the reason why I'm saying it's not as, uh, as, as simple as the Suez problem price goes up, not only because of the price fade that we're seeing at the moment, but generally how short-term market prices react in WTI crude is much more about you know, where is the production refinement of these products, not so much the passage and the, the maritime route. Um, I guess it's kind of a timing issue. If it was to be prolonged, then, then it could have impacts. And certainly then talking about the Suez, the Suez is strategically important uh, globally. Um, so a bit of detail here. 
As many as 10 crude tankers carrying around 13 million barrels of oil could be uh, affected by the disrupted traffic in the Suez Canal, and obviously that number's going up all of the time. Uh, the approximate rate of backlog is around 50 vessels per day, and any delays leading to the rerouting around the Suez would take around 15 days extra to voyage between the Middle East and Europe. And I just wanted to give you a bit of you know, a, a geography kind of lesson in regards to what does that look like. So the Suez obviously is, is situated here uh, and acts as a, as a conduit, if you like, to connect then the voluminous amount of crude oil that comes out of, sorry, I'll just back this up a little bit, that comes out of uh, the Gulf of, uh, the Persian Gulf. So here you've got Saudi Arabia, um, Iraq, Iran, and Kuwait, so which are the top four producers within OPEC. And the predominant amount of deposit of crude oil that's being extracted coming out of the, the northern part of the Gulf of the Persian Gulf. We then have two key straits that need to be navigated from a maritime perspective. Um, and obviously around approximate a third of the world's um, transportation of all maritime crude at one point has to go through the strategic choke point of the, of the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, and that in itself, uh, highly contested waters <coughs> because you've got the northern tip of Amman and the southern um, location of Iran here and obviously the ongoing friction historically between Saudi and uh, Iran and how this gets expressed then through US sanctions and then Iran's proxy war in Yemen down here at the bottom with predominant concentration in western Yemen of Houthi militants which then fire north um, missile drone strikes and so on into Saudi Aramco infrastructure. Beyond then the passage of the Straits of Hormuz, where there is obviously large um, global, predominantly US and Western military um, support to ensure the passage of transportation of goods through this area. You then have to, there's the second strait, which is over here then, um, over towards the tip, Western southern tip of uh, Yemen, when we're talking about um, El Mendab Strait, which then goes into the Red Sea, and that ultimately then goes up into Egypt and into the Suez. As I just mentioned, if the Suez is blocked then, the alternate is going around the African continent and the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa to go all the way around. And you know this is a historical kind of trade route, uh, if you like. And to, to, in order to circumvent, if you like, going through the Suez and around Africa, it would add approximately 15 days to transportation. And obviously when you're talking about the cost of goods, the cost is gonna become more expensive for lots of different reasons. Um, so, bit of context, and then moving back then, some of 12% uh, of global crude and about 9% of total seaborne traded petroleum, including crude oil and refined petroleum products, do pass through the Suez Canal and Sumed pipeline, according to the EI estimates. Uh, so 12% of global trade is going through the, the Suez. Um, you might have read about, uh, there are in fact two Suez canals nowadays, there's actually a new and an old one. Um, the problem is, is that this graphic doesn't quite go into the, the, the greatest amount of detail, but where Evergreen, the ship, uh, is grounded is right at the, pretty much the entrance. And there's actually kind of like a, a reservoir pool, if you like, a little bit further in, which would then split off the old and the new Suez. Uh, which then could have created then alternate uh, kind of route that the traffic could have taken. But the problem is, is this, this is right bottlenecked at the bottom. So it's blocking everything else coming through. Um, the Sumed pipeline, as you can see here, is the other the transportation area uh, aside from the Suez. Um, you know, one of the things here as well, I guess, while we're talking about it from an educational point of view, you know, this, this type of... Um, passage and, and voluminous passage of crude oil, of course, is one of the key reasons why there is strong Western, particularly US military interest in this particular region uh, and an alliance with uh, Egypt in particular, as well as Saudi Arabia. If you think about the alliance with those nations, although um, Islamic terrorism, you could suggest from a, 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 a locational point of view from the where, where these people come from is predominantly Saudi Arabian and Egyptian, in fact, in terms of Western terrorist activity on US soil over the last 50 years. But actually, when you think about it from a, 
uh, a strategic point of view, Saudi Arabia is the key predominant producer of crude oil in the Middle East, and then Egypt is ultimately very key, as I said, contributing to 12% of global trade of crude going through the Suez or the Sumid uh, pipeline as well at the same time. So it makes sense then from a strategic point of view to have US military presence and a political alignment with these nations uh, for those reasons, irrespective of other things that might come on the back of that. Um, the final things then to, to mention, um, wh when can we expect this to be rectified and what would that look like and how would it happen? Um, the things that I've read is the best chance of freeing a massive container ship, as much as there's been reports about they're trying to dig out a little bit, they've tried tugboats uh, and things like that. Probably the most likelihood here is freeing up this tanker might not come until Sunday through to Monday. And the reason of that is you've got to start timing then just the, the just natural um, flow of tidal waves uh, and tide will reach its peak. So spring tide peak is, a, is between Sunday and Monday. And that's gonna add approximately 18 inches, which will allow for the potential for more maneuvering for the ship. So it might be that we need to let nature take its course uh, in that respect, rather than trying to, to intervene in any other way. So it could be that we don't actually see any movement on this until the next couple of days, until the beginning of next week. Uh, to give you a visual idea of what the actual Suez looks like, uh, my, my wife says she's actually swam in, um, in the Suez when she was younger. My wife's Egyptian. Uh, and she, was, she, was, she couldn't believe it when she saw some of the photos because she said, I don't remember it being that narrow. Uh, and as much as I was saying, well, I'm sure it's all not that narrow. Um, the idea here being that at its most narrow point, it's only about 205 meters wide. Uh, so, you know, if you think of Usain Bolt running 100 meters times that by two, and that's about the size that you can visually uh, think of. So it is very narrow. Um, and one of the problems that it encounters is that if there is ever poor visibility from a weather perspective, there's obviously just very little room for error when you're trying to pass through. Um, the other, I think, good point to be aware of here is the top three exporters of crude and oil products who use the Suez uh, in 2021 so far, the Russians, uh, 546,000 barrels per day, Saudi Arabia, 410,000 barrels per day, and Iraq, 400,000. <coughs> barrels per day so the, the end kind of point that I wanted to, to have with this discussion I know I've gone into it in quite a bit of detail when arguably it's not really I, I know a product that a lot of you might look at or the price isn't spectacularly swinging around the reason why I've gone into quite a bit of detail here and might be worth just re-watching uh, again and making some notes is that I'd say one of the one of the things that I've learned in my career being working in what I do, which is to understand and interpret news and information. Um, it's not the sort of thing that you can just kind of read and then it's like, right, you're set, now go off in the world and you're able to do your job. I would say being good at global macro from a news perspective um, it's just about picking up these little nuggets of information at the time they arise, you know, go into some of the details, you know, what is the canal, how big is it, what type of ships go through it, how often, um, what are the risks, what's the time to pass through the Suez, what particular countries are moving products through there. If you can actually just spend one afternoon going into that type of detail, make some notes, put it in your head, um, you can kind of compartmentalize it for later, but it, it's this idea of building up your repertoire, your building blocks of knowledge um, that ultimately becomes a very powerful tool for memory recall when a headline breaks on Twitter or you hear a squawk box and they say something about one of these strategic areas uh, of significance and you can just make a decision on the spot instantaneously. So, you know, hence the reason why trading the news is such a, a difficult thing to do, because ultimately it requires a very deep and a large breadth of, of knowledge about a number of different things. If you're really going to be agile enough to, to trade within the intraday environment, reacting to news as it's really happening. So hopefully that was a good exercise to sort of talk through the Suez uh, and give a bit of perspective. 
Uh, if you go on my Twitter account, uh, you'll be able to find my morning note where I've got all the details that I've just discussed as well, uh, if you want to check it out. Otherwise, final things to have a quick look at, North Korea. Um, I think I've discussed this enough really about um, our expectancy of further activity from North Korea for the reasons between the proxy of US and China. Um, interestingly, from a symbolic point of view, this latest two ballistic missiles that North Korea have shot it was actually into the sea near Japan. And yesterday in Japan was the commencement of the Olympic torch relay ahead of the summer games that were delayed. So somewhat symbolic there against one of the allied nations of the US. So again, ratcheting up the pressure on a geopolitical level. Markets unfazed, as you would expect, because this sort of thing, you can expect more of it to happen in future as well. In terms of the calendar for today, um, it's pretty quiet in the UK European morning. <coughs> US data is a bit more interesting. You've got the um, Q4 final GDP. So that's probably not the most exciting thing you're going to see today. Expected to be unrevised at 4.1%. Um, but you do have weekly jobless claims, which obviously have bumped up a little bit in, in recent weeks. Expected to decelerate slightly to 730 from 777,000. So keep an eye out for that. Um, you've also got Joe Biden's actually giving his first formal press conference. I know we hear from Biden, it seems quite a lot, but he hasn't given one of his keynote speeches yet. Um, I did distribute a full primer in the Amplify Live community yesterday, so have a read of that. Definitely worth uh, getting getting yourself up to up to speed. But all in all, it might be short on specific details, particularly on the infrastructure, kind of new stimulus package plans. A little bit more broad brush, of course. Um, but nonetheless, it's going to be something potentially of interest and certainly something I'll cover in the briefing tomorrow morning. He's speaking just after 5 p.m. London time. Um, really busy, though, on the speaker slate. I mean, it's jam-packed. Um, everything from the Bank of England's Governor Bailey, who's already been on tape this morning, um, and also going to be followed by, I think there's another BOE member uh, potentially later as well. But what is Bailey going to say? To be honest, I don't think a great deal. Again, he's speaking at the unveiling of a new £50 banknote uh, and uh, also the proximity. Yeah, it's Bailey, um, so it's Bailey twice. Um, but also, the Bank of England rate decision was not that long ago. As I said before, not expecting much overall from these guys. Lagarde, um, again, same case. But from a Fed perspective, potentially a little bit more interesting. And they're speaking throughout the day. So Feds Williams is a voter. Feds Clarida, voter. Bostick voter, Evans voter, and Daily voter. Now, the reason why this, these are a little bit more interesting is not all of them, but most of them, Clarida speaking on US economic outlook and monetary policy. Feds Bostick speaking on measuring the economy during COVID-19. Feds Evans, current economic conditions and monetary policy. Daily, monetary policy and fiscal policy. So, so unlike Lagarde and Bailey, a lot of the Fed guys are speaking absolutely on point of what the markets could be sensitive to if they were to say something out of line of what we've heard generally from Powell of late. So I would definitely have all of those marked up um, on your on your calendar for today. Then the final thing I wanted to mention, something to be aware of at around five o'clock uh, later on late afternoon, is traders will be kind of very much aware of the fact that the seven year note auction coming out of the US just given what a disaster it was back in February. So far, uh, I think we've had two, twos and fives coming out of the US Treasury, and they've been okay, fine, no disasters. The seven year was previously. If it goes through okay today, that will, I think, put to bed any idea of disruptions um, after that initial failed, or not close to, uh, to a failed auction we had before. All right, that is it. Going to leave you to it, let you get on with the day. Any questions at all, feel free to just, just drop me a comment or I'll see you in the, the Amplify Live Discord room. Thanks very much.